Match day eight in MLS is in the books and only one unbeaten team remains. That's right, your Philadelphia Union. We go over the club's comeback win in the Music City before turning our focus to a place where the Union haven't been so successful in years past. That and more as Union Insider starts right now. Daniel Gazda takes the strike on and it's off the inside of the post. It's up the Argentine. Oh, brilliant. So Martinez fires. Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of Union Insider presented by Independence Blue Cross. I'm your host, Marissa Pilla. As always, I'm joined by Sebastian Latou and Shane and Williams as we break down the Union's events over this past weekend. So the Union were back on the road on Saturday night facing against a Nashville SC team that's been a bit rocky so far in this 2024 year. Philly, on the other hand, well, they came in as one of the three unbeaten teams left in MLS play. The Union were looking to keep that streak going while the home side was looking to get in the win column for just the second time in this young season. Here's how it all went down in Nashville. We've witnessed standing ovations for the team after winning two straight over Portland and Minnesota. And tonight, they eye an encore in the Music City where Jim Curtin's men hit the road looking to strike another eye-popping tune that crescendos into a W. From Geodis Park in Nashville, Tennessee, it's the first of two regular season meetings as the Philadelphia Union visit Nashville SC. Hey guys, look, uh, a whole new challenge for us today, all right? Guys, the hardest thing to do in this league is to win on the road, right? But there's no better feeling than getting three points on the road, right? And then taking the air out of the crowd, making 30,000 people go silent. That's our goal today, but it's going to take every guy for 90 minutes. Let's go. Come on, here we go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. There's the whistle from Victor Rivas as we're underway from the Music City. Lovin sends his right hand up and his right boots down and staggered approach. He balls this forward to the back post on a bending ball. Header there, stopped by Zemla! Nice play by Good Zemla. Spin here by Wheel. Plays across right to the mixer. Off of Zemla, collided with God. There's an open goal right now. Kajoy plays it on frame. Zemla says no! Who's living with Rivas, the referee? We'll find Yearwood out to the left. Here comes Schaffelberg, the perilous one. Harriel defending a couple of step overs with the cross. Header by Surridge and a goal for Nashville at home. The Union lost Surridge on a beautiful cross by Schaffelberg. That's his third assist of the last two games. one nothing Nashville at home here in the 43rd minute. Waiting the whistle from Rivas, puts his hand up. There's the halftime whistle. What do you want to see for the club as far as adjustments go shaded in, in half number two? Send numbers forward. Now you have to come out of your shell a little bit, being down one nothing. I want to see Nate get forward on that right-hand side. We saw Kai at the end of the half. They have to send numbers forward. Martinez, a direct ball over the top. Hit Sullivan, win it amid two. Does it for power, falls over the crowds, and tips it forward, and scores! Carranza does it again! And what a play! Here comes McGlynn with the in-swinging ball. A lot of whiz on that. And a goal! Off of the corner. And it's Daniel Gazda! And the Union have a 2-1 lead. Love it. Plays him off top to Surridge. One by Glass. That's edge of the area. Mukhtar falls down. Mukhtar gathers himself. Pass Glass. Out comes Zemba. Zemba stops him. Big stop from Zemba outside the six. There's the full time whistle. And the Union take three points in the Music City. So while the end result was a positive one, the first half was not really. The club looked pretty sloppy. It led to Nashville being up one nothing at the break. So what was the biggest misconnection in the first 45? I think maybe the fact that they play at three in the back, you know, starting this game as the first time of the year with the low Elliott and Glesness, and you can see like he was not really connecting, you know, passes. We didn't get too many dangerous occasions besides maybe some corners uh, and free kicks. So I think when they switch, you know, into the 4-4-2 with the two sub, you know, Bedoya and Baizo coming in, I think it was a big difference into this game. It really helped the team coming back and get the win. 
Yeah, what did you see from the breakdown in that first 45 minutes? They just looked disjointed. I thought that the front three were looking to press while the back five was staying back. And when you do two different things, it doesn't really work out for you as well as you'd like. It's the first time, like Seba talked about, that they played it all year, and it looked like the first time that they played it. Yeah, it was it was an odd choice to see that roll out, but they did switch back to the 4-4-2 diamond when Bedoya uh, subbed back in in the second half. So what was the biggest positive from that change? I think with just some more creativity, you know, into the midfield, I think, you know, playing what four. We saw Baizo right away and on his right side, you know, switching with Ariel going back to the left, like coming, being really dangerous, you know, giving some good cross. We see a few opportunities before the first goal of Carranza. And uh, I think having kind of like this type of shape was a bit better for the Union to keep defending the same way, which I think they did a very good job the entire game to be uh, good defensively, just giving opportunity uh, on corners and long throw. We see Nashville didn't have their best game as well, but I think it's because the way the Union defending, but the help, I think, from Baizo and having Ariel going higher, we always know it's kind of the strength of the union and they put a bit more pressure into the Nashville and they were able to score, you know, a great goal with Caronza and of course at the end, the, I think it might be the, the trademark this year of the union, the late goal, you know, to get the three point. We can all agree the game winning goal on Saturday was electric, we, but we want to take a deeper dive on the goal that brought the union and Nashville level as we bring you our key play of the week presented by Subaru. Seba will answer the call this week to break down the goal by Julian Carranza and how it came to be. Seba? Thank you, Marissa. So yes, the key of the game is this play from Martinez. You can see right away he has his head up. You can see Sullivan asking for the ball with his hand up because there's a little uh, you know, miscommunication in defense of Nashville. Not the best ball for Martinez, but great challenge for Sullivan. A lot of forward will foul you know, into this play, but he keep you know, his head on the ball. See those two players. You see Gazdag and Carranza just underneath, you know, waiting for the ball. Perfectly passed. You can play right now for Sullivan to Carranza who for me as a forward, this ability, technical ability of Caranza to finish is very amazing. He traps the ball, do one step, and then with the outside of his foot, find the corner of the goal of Panico. Can do nothing because he's surprised, you know, from his shot. I think it's a very good ability from Caranza. He scores again into this game, three games in a row, scoring a goal for the Union. He's on form and he's very confident and he starts how he prove it in this goal. And what I like too about this goal is see how many players, if you pause it right here, one, two, three, four Union players, you know, into the box, almost, you know, helping Sullivan underneath. And it's something we didn't see a lot into the first half. And it's the strongness, you know, of this team when they attack together as a group and you can see minimum four players, you know, finishing into the box. It's how they score goal, but credit to Sullivan with another assist, but a great finish from Carranza to give the 1-1 into this game. All right, Seba, thanks for that great breakdown. We've got more Union Insider for you in a bit, but first, here's your Union trivia question presented by United Concordia. How many times has there been a tie for most goals in a season in Union history? Find out the answer later in the show. Time now for this week's Tweet of the Week. The Union extended their win streak to three and their unbeaten streak to six on Saturday, and this fan is loving it. At Elvia tweeted this gif of Julian Carranza and said, undefeated, my dudes, with a hashtag dupe on the end. Seems like we're not the only ones excited about the Union start. Welcome back to Union Insider presented by Independence Blue Cross. I'm Marissa Pilla. So sure, the Union are the only unbeaten team left in MLS this season, but they weren't the only Philly team to go unbeaten this weekend. Down in Florida, the Union U-17 team went on an insane run to win the Generation Adidas Cup for the second consecutive year, beating LA Galaxy's U-17s in PKs this weekend. Sage Hurley has more on everything they accomplished in this edition of Union Roundup presented by Green Mountain Energy. What's up, Union fans? I'm Sage Hurley here with this week's edition of Union Roundup, once again starring the Baby Snakes. This time, we're talking about the Philadelphia Union Academy U-17s, who won their second straight Generation Adidas Cup over the weekend. The kids beat multiple top-tier international clubs to win it, beating teams from Brazil, South Korea, and Croatia to make it to the final match. 
That last game was against fellow MLS Academy LA Galaxy, and it was an intense one. The match ended in full time in a 2-2 draw thanks to goals from Diego Rocio and Kevin Sullivan, and it had to go to penalty kicks, but the traditional five rounds just weren't enough. Keeper Gavin Atkinson forced a sudden death save in round three, setting the stage for Neil Pierre to convert from the spot while LA Galaxy missed their last chance, and it sent the Union into a frenzy of celebration. And the Philadelphia Union are back to back Generation Adidas Cup U17 champions! Together, they hoisted the Generation Adidas Cup for the second straight year, proving again why the Philadelphia Union Academy is one of, if not the, top of its kind in the entire United States. Their overall performance earned multiple players individual honors. Diego Rocio was named Player of the Tournament. I can't even explain the feeling, you know. Uh, the first time we won it, you know, I had that feeling we could win it again. I'm um, just happy to play a part in it. And, you know, I got to thank the team. Without them, this wouldn't be possible. Gavin Atkinson won the U-17 Best Goalkeeper Award, then Rocio and Neil Pierre were both named to the GA Cup Best 11. Overall, it was another successful trip to Florida for the U-17s, led by first-year head coach Peter McDonald. That's all for this week's edition of Union Roundup. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Sage. And while Nashville was full of excitement, it's time to leave that win in the past and turn our eyes to the road ahead for the Union, which leads them down to Atlanta on Saturday night. Fellas, you know what time that is. It's time for Keys to the Game presented by Subaru. So what is a key to a good win down at Atlanta? I mean, again, a very, very tough stadium to play at. Uh, the Union did a great job in Nashville, and I think they just need to do the same thing, which is let the game come to you. I think we, we saw that uh, if the team doesn't do many mistakes, you know, losing the ball at some uh, good spot in the midfield, and they frustrate, you know, a team of Atlanta, I think they can find their story in the second half, like I see a lot, you know, during this season, and score a goal or two or three to really frustrate the Atlanta team. So. It's what I will say. It's like, let the game come to you. Don't try to go too fast. Don't try to do too much and frustrate this Atlanta team who is going to want to win, of course, in front of the fan. They have a chip on their shoulder knowing that the Union is the only undefeated team. So more motivation from Atlanta. But at the same time for the Union, it's a great motivation as well to stay undefeated in this league until a long, long time. Yeah, and you were practicing, you told the team to practice patience too earlier in the season as well. It seems like that's a recurring thing for, for you. I mean, it's not my keys. You know, I don't think they <laughs> listen to me, but uh, I'm glad you know, they did, but you can see that a lot of points have been win on the road this year at the end of the game. So hopefully it's going to be the same case in Atlanta. All right. How about for you, Shannon? My key to the game is going to be to stay compact defensively. We know that the Union can score goals, especially on the road. Can they do a good job of limiting time and space for players like Tiago Almada and Yakamakas up top? If they can do that, then they'll have a better chance of getting three points on the road. We know that they're going to work on defensively, staying compact, limiting those little spaces in between the lines. And I think that they've done a good job with so far with the teams that they've played. We know that Atlanta will be a different beast with how potent offensively they are. If they can do that, then they can get three points in Atlanta. Do you expect that back line to be now four to, in order to stay compact that way? After hearing what Jim said uh, in the post game, I definitely think that they'll be in a back four. I think they're more comfortable in a back four. I think that for them, it's something that they are so good at now that they need to stay in that back four, at least for the time being, until they need it to bust out the back three to, to match up with somebody else. Right, stick to what you know, stick to what you're good at. So the Union are unbeaten in MLS, but they're winless at Mercedes-Benz Stadium, 0-4-3 and in their time visiting down there. What do they have to do to, to change that? I think just playing the same way as they've been playing this year away, you know, they had a great win in Portland, another great win in Nashville. They came back late, you know, in Kansas City with uh, maybe not the best team in the first half, you know, with a lot of change. But I think every time, you know, Jim Curtin this year, you know, uses subs, he made a difference into this game. So hopefully, you know, we don't know yet who is going to be able to play. We saw Kai Viner coming off with a little injury on the left side. You know, we can see that the team could be the same, you know, offensively. Michael Ura was not, you know, in Nashville. So let's see what best lineup, you know, Jim Curtin is going to start. And then whoever comes on the bench usually make a difference. So hopefully be the case again and the team can maybe get their first win in Atlanta this season. Well, we're coming up on a break for Union Insider, but when we return, these guys will help break down a player on the five stripes that is sure to give the Union some problems on Saturday. We'll be right back after this. Time now for our Chick-fil-A Nugget of the Week. The Union now unbeaten in their first six matches of the season. This ties the club record for the longest unbeaten streak to start an MLS season matching the 2022 team. 
Welcome back to Union Insider presented by Independence Blue Cross. Atlanta is always a tough place to play with it being one of the few turf stadiums in the MLS. The field plays a lot faster than other venues around the league, but there's a player on Atlanta that regardless of playing surface is always a dangerous threat in the attack. And that player is Yorgos Yakimakis. While he makes the spotlight this week in our player profile presented by Subaru. Yakimakis came over from Celtic FC as a designated player on February 8th of last year. Since arriving in Atlanta, he's been an instant source of offense, scoring 22 goals, adding four assists in his 31 career matches with the Five Stripes. His 17 goal and three assists last year led him to being voted as the 2023 MLS Newcomer of the Year, while also earning a spot on the 2023 MLS Best 11. So, Yakimakis, we've seen a lot of great forwards come and challenge the Union defensively, but what are his biggest strengths? For me, I mean, if we compare to, let's say, Mukhtar, you know, we saw in Nashville, completely different player. He's more a number nine for me, more somebody who's going to always be behind the two center backs. He's tall, he's strong, he can score with header, but he can finish as well in the box, and he's good making runs. So he pretty much has everything into his back. So he's a very dangerous forward. It's something hard to mark, I think, for the center backs because he popped up sometimes a little bit lower, but he's always sometimes playing on the shoulder as well to go into the space and, and make those runs that you are not expecting a big tall forward like him do. So he, he's been good, he's been you know, in confident for this team, and when he plays at home, he scores a lot. So it's going to be a big task for the Union, but he's a very, very dangerous player. And I think if, like Shannon say, like tactically the defense do a good job, you know, being compact, it's going to be harder for him to find the space and make sure that he, does, he doesn't score in this game. So Shannon, for you, if you're a defender playing against him, what is the mental conversation going through your head as he's moving around the field? So he, like Seba talked about, he's a true number nine and somebody that's going to rely on a lot of service. We know that Atlanta has the players that can provide good service in for him. So if they can do a good job of stepping out to guys, not letting in free crosses, getting a body on Tiago Almada, I think that they can limit his opportunities in front of goal. Also, just trying to put him off, whether it be a little nudge in the box, something to not let him get a clean run in at, at the goal. I think that they'll be able to do a good job. We know that, that the Union have some strong defenders and guys that can deal with him physically. Can they do a good job of making sure that they know where he's at at all times and not letting him have free runs into the box? Let's put a pin in the Union conversation for now as we take a look at what the rest of MLS was up to this weekend in Around the League presented by Torque. Another week, another insane comeback and stoppage time winner in MLS. Sebastian Driosi put this one in the back of the net in the 11th minute of stoppage time to give Austin FC a 4-3 win and send the crowd home happy. And in another edition of one of the best rivalries in MLS, Dennis Bulwanga scored in the 36th minute of 2024's first El Trafico to give LAFC a 2-1 lead. That score wouldn't move from there as LAFC took home round number one, and it's always exciting when the these two teams meet up. When Union Insider returns, Seba and Shannon will give us their players to watch for Saturday's match as the Union face off against Atlanta United. We'll be right back after this. Here's the answer to this week's Union trivia question presented by United Concordia. A tie at the top of the goal scoring leaderboard has happened twice in Union history. The first was in 2018 when Fafa Pico and Corey Burke each scored 10, and the second was just last season when Daniel Gazdag and Julian Carranza both scored 14. The final segment here on Union Insider presented by Independence Blue Cross, which means to wrap this up, we need our All-State players to watch. Seba, who are you keeping eye on, eyes on in Atlanta? I'm going to keep an eye on somebody we didn't talk too much this season about, and it's Jack Maglin. Uh, I think, you know, in a game against Nashville, uh, it was great to see him, you know, getting his first assist on a corner kick uh, for Daniel Gazdag. We saw he, what he can do on set pieces as well. You know, we know Kai Wagner, of course, but Maglin can be one of the guys who can deliver some good balls, and I would like to see him a little bit more on the ball in this game against Atlanta, maybe trying to find all the forwards more into their feet, and be the guy we can reel ball in the midfielder to kind of start the opportunity of the action for the Union. We saw that sometimes the ball is a bit lost too easy by our defense. So if you can just him find the fit and have Jack, you know, find the balls and hopefully maybe giving another two or three assists, you know, in this game. No, I'm going to one or two would be nice. It will be, be amazing. So I'm looking forward to having another game because I think with his first assist he got in the first game against Nashville, he's going to be boosting his confidence into this game. It's been great seeing him come into his own even early early on in this season and Shane and for you. 
For me, I'm going to go with the man in form. I'm going to go with Carranza, trying to score in four consecutive games. He's really shouldered the, the burden, the scoring burden for this Union team, and I think he can make it four and four. So I, I hope that he can get himself going. Sevda talked about Jack McGlynn, and, and why not Jack McGlynn and Julian Carranza? I go. like that combination, and we talked about how Yakimakis is on a hot streak for Atlanta. Let's get Carranza's hot streak going, too. We got one of our own. That's going to do it for this one. The Union are back on the road as they travel to Mercedes-Benz Stadium to take on Atlanta United. This time, Sunday, 2.30 p.m. This will be on national TV on Fox, but you can also listen to Dave Leno and Seba on the radio call, WWDB 860 AM. For Shannon and Seba, I'm Marissa, and we'll see you next week.